Well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm Dimitri. Um, I appreciate you being here you know, a few minutes after lunch. And hopefully everybody will be awake by now with such an interesting lens talk. <laughs> Very interesting. Day. So this talk is about what I've been doing for the last three years now, a bit more. And, uh, I basically wrote a little trading agent to trade Bitcoins and wrote that in Haskell. And um, it's been trading for a while. I've just open sourced this code. Uh, to be honest with you, the version that is online is a cleaned up version of the most sophisticated and also messier version I had. But I intend to go forward working on this one. Right? So this is just being open source on my GitHub account. I'll have the link at the end of the slides. Um, we do have quite a bit of time. Um, and I want this session to be as interactive as possible. So if you guys you know, want at any point, like if I've lost you or just want to ask a question, please do so. I hope we don't have to use all the time available. Um, but as you'll see, we're going to go through quite a few different introductions. And at the end, everything will tie back together. Right? But we're going to have to go to different places so that we make sure everybody's on the same page. And you know, we know where we're going. Okay. Uh, any questions before we start? Can anybody see the screen well? Uh, there will be code on the screen, and I, I'm trying to, I'm hoping that you guys can see the code and kind of follow along actually. So if you can't see the code or eyesight's not that, that good, please move forward, or maybe, I'm not sure I can make it bigger. Okay. Right, let's go. So let's start with trading. Okay. And we're going to talk about how the stock market works. So let's consider stock market like NASDAQ. You want to buy and sell Microsoft shares. How does that actually work? Yeah. So imagine you're the first person that shows up and you want to buy some Microsoft shares. So you want to buy 10 shares of Microsoft and you only want to pay $50 each for those shares. Right? NASDAQ has a order book, just a book that keeps all the open orders. And you know, you're the first person that shows up, you're just gonna put your order in the books, there's nobody else for you to trade with. Okay. Actually, before I do this, how many people know the mechanics of trading in the stock exchange? Does anybody know that? Quite a few people. So I'm just gonna go through this a little quickly for the benefit of the people that don't follow this. Um, so the first person shows up, Second person wants to sell, you know, 10 shares of Microsoft, but is asking for a higher price, right? $60 each doesn't quite match $50 each. So they can't, these two people cannot trade, so the second order also goes on this, okay? Third person shows up, again, wants to buy eight shares of Microsoft, an even lower price, so it can't trade, the order is going to go on the books, okay? So next person comes up and they want to sell five shares of Microsoft stock. And now the price is actually good, right? So you want to sell for $47, somebody wants to buy for 50, they can actually do a trade. And the rule is that you always do the trade for the price on the books, right? So this, in this case, you're going to do the trade for $50, right? And what's going to happen is that, you know, you're going to, buy and sell five of those 10 shares that are available in the books and the remainders is going to stay on the books, right? And this is what happens, right? Easy. And those just happen all the time. But those are limit orders because they specify price in a volume, right? Or amount of shares to buy and sell. So another share, no, say so this, this is how it works, right? And we have names for these orders, you know, the, the orders to buy a bids and the orders to sell as asks, right? And we can keep doing this, right? You can see we ordered the book here um, by price, increasing price, right? And now let's keep doing this. So now the order to buy, to sorry, sell um, three shares at $66 comes in, just goes on the top because it's an order, book, right? Just makes our life simpler. Another one comes in at a lower price. Now this is the best price. So it just also goes on the books, but you know, at a better position, right? That's the cheapest offer to sell. And now, now the order comes in to buy, 
and you can see that the prices actually match, right? The $61 is higher than the two lower offers to sell. These are gonna match. You wanna sell six shares, sorry, buy six shares. This is gonna match the bottom two shares for the lowest price of 59, and then also four of the 60. And this is gonna match, you're gonna trade for the prices on the book, and it's gonna go away, right? And the volumes are gonna be decreased, right? So this is the, the mechanics of how the whole thing works. Right? So the, until now we've talked about limit orders where you have a price and a volume, right? But you can also have market orders, right? And this guy's, for example, somebody wants to sell two shares, whatever the market price might be, right? And in this case, it's gonna match the, you know, the bid for $50 and some of the volume is gonna disappear, it's gonna trade. Right? And you can also have a you know, market order when you specify total funds. There's a lot of price. The $200 here is how many dollars you want to spend overall. In this case, it's going to match the you know, lower ask price. You can do three shares for $180. So part of the $200 is not going to be used, but they're going to trade. Okay. So this is how basically it works. You just repeat that. And you know, that's how the market works overall. Okay. So this is how stock markets work in general. Now, things we saw here, it's bids and buys, you know, as I asked. Um, it's, everything's processed in first in, first out order, right? So if an order comes in on the books um, for the same price as an order that's already there, you don't even want to trade later, okay? Uh, and you always execute everything on the order book price. Okay, so, how does that differ from Bitcoin? Well, it's the same thing for Bitcoin, but you can only buy one share of Microsoft. You can't buy a half a share of you know, Microsoft. But you have, you know, uh, 10 to the minus eight power of a Bitcoin being the Unix as a Toshi that can be traded, right? So everything in terms of uh, Bitcoin is expressed in terms of Satoshi. Right? And you trade, instead of the NASDAQ, in these different websites, there are Bitcoin exchanges. But the mechanism is basically the same, okay? So um, let me show you two of the biggest uh, websites here. So can I, my mouse point is kind of dead. Can I get my mouse back? There you go. So GDAX is in San Francisco, is Coinbase, right? And if I just click here, this is their, this is a website. I'm not sure if you can see that well. Do you make, back, make that bigger? Is it big enough? Um, so what you can see, I'm just, just too, too big. Uh, well, what you can see here, what you can see here is the same two books we had before. The red numbers are the asks, the green one of the bids. You can see the volumes on the left. And you can see the you know, eight zeros there and specified in Satoshi, you know, and so this guy he wants to sell 2.33 bitcoins for a price of $1,181 per bitcoin, right? And you can see this change is pretty fast. Well, not so fast right now, but you know, pretty fast. Okay, so this is the GDAX exchange. Uh, whoops. Um, there's also Bitstamp, just another exchange in Europe, and they work pretty much the same way. Uh, if you scroll down here, there you go. They also show you their live order book, and you can see the bids and the asks. And what I call the volume, they call amount, which is the number of bitcoins they want to buy and sell. And um, they also have a column here that shows the total value of that order, right? In dollars, right? But this is the same idea. You can see here that the bids are, are ordered um, decreasing price and the ask the order increasing price. Uh, to me, that looks like a, you know, a zipper. So that's one of the things that convinced me that bids and asks should have the same type. <laughs> but uh, anyway, here we go. So these are just you know, two of the many exchanges that buy and sell Bitcoins, right? Um, many of them. Okay, so how do we trade on these exchanges, right? Well, you can just go online on the website and trade yourself as a human, right? But they also provide um, REST APIs, wallet socket APIs, and FIX APIs. Uh, FIX is a protocol used in the 
when our students show up. Okay, so they do provide this. Um, well, what can you do? What exactly can you do? And a little bit of Haskell here. Uh, this is my action type, which is no, is in the code, and basically tells you what are the things you can do in an exchange, right? And you can see here it's super simple, right? Um, I'm not using the very fancy order types. You can just place a limit order, and you have to specify you want to buy or sell, the price, and how much you want to buy or sell. A market order, right? And the market order, as you saw, is a little bit more complicated because you might want to specify, you know, just how many bitcoins you want to sell, or you want to specify how much money do you have to buy, and buy as many bitcoins as possible, right? So again, trying to make uh, invalid states and representable, this field of AC volume or funds tries to catch, you know, match that situation, right? Maybe I should have used lenses, you never know. <laughs> uh, and then you cannot cancel a market order because market orders are supposed to be executed immediately once they're placed, right? So you can only cancel a limit order that's still on the books. If it's been executed, you can't, you no, know, you can't cancel that either. And obviously, um, you can see here the panic um, used to be send Dimitri a text message. Uh, <laughs> so, but that's, that's basically what you can do, right? You can place, a, you place an order, market or, or limit, you can cancel it, you can transfer money out. That's it. Okay? Uh, everybody good on that, right? What okay. happens if uh, your order is not executed? It's, it's... <clears throat> so, um, if you place a limit order, it does no, not place a market order. Well, there's only one circumstance I can think of where that's going to happen. Is that when you want to buy a you know, hundred thousand bitcoins in the market, and there are only a hundred available, right? And then, yeah, your market order is bigger than the whole market. It's going to be pending, right? I don't know how the exchange is going to deal with that. Well, that would be one circumstance, but then there's there are also these uh, nanosecond traders. Well, I mean, so. The exchange is going to process orders in strict sequential, uh, sequentially strictly. So if it gets the order, uh, no, instant T, it's not supposed to process anybody else's order before that market order is fully filled, right? So it's not allowed to basically put somebody else in front of you. What would you find out? If that was happening or not? No. When would you? When would you find out? If so, so you place an order. Mm -hmm. Now, when do you find out the results of that order? Oh, so using the no, depending on which API you're using. For example, the REST API. As soon as you make the connection, it's going to give you a reply either with the order ID. You're going to see that next, right? Or you can see or that on the data screen. So we we're going to see an example of that next in the field. Does that answer your question? Not necessarily, but go ahead. <laughs> right. if, if there's something else you're trying to, I just not told me exactly what the question is because that sequential only is to be forced. Um, if you read something like Flash Voice, hmm. they have these nanosecond orders. Right. Well, uh, this even is, NASDAQ is strictly ordered, right? Right. Um, well, so it's not the strict ordering. So there's a difference. In Flash Boys, you have a national market where there are multiple venues where you can buy and sell Microsoft stock, mm -hmm. and then you can route order to NASDAQ to so different places, right? Mm -hmm. In this situation, you just look at one, one of those exchanges. So you can't route the order everywhere, anywhere else and actually expect to achieve the price. It's just have one, one order, think of it as like one order. Absolutely. Yes, one quick, probably dumb question. In the stock market, I'm putting money into thinking that a company will do well, right? So I have all these choices of companies and I'm watching what they're doing. Uh, in this, is it just literally Bitcoins? I'm just saying, I think Bitcoins are doing this or this, so I'm going to buy Bitcoins and there's no miss to anything. It's just Bitcoins by itself. This is just Bitcoins, okay. right? So the Bitcoin price goes up, make money. Okay. It goes down. Another currency, though. It's a, a forex exchange. So it's Bitcoin compared to the dollar or to a, another unit. Right. So there's there's, there's different. 
just not just it's like the value of Bitcoin could really be different relative to what the currency rate on the is. Actually, so that's that's a very common um, way of doing arbitrage in Bitcoin, okay. and I I do this all the time. So uh, you monitor two markets, and it turns out that say at DAX, the price of Bitcoin is eleven hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and at Bitstamp is eleven hundred twenty. You buy a DAX and you sell the stack really quickly. And that's why you see all those changes when you do that. You know, there must be bots doing this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like maybe you can like use this bot. To do it. <laughs> right. That's the really okay. good thing. Okay. So, uh, any more questions? We good? All right. So, second part, right? How do we use these APIs to trade? Okay. And these APIs are very simple. So um, there's some problems with them, though. You know, because you're doing this pretty quickly, um, synchronization is key. Uh, and let's just consider one example here, right? Um, say you want to place an order, right? And you're using just a REST API. You make a post request, Bitstamp, right? So you place an order, and you get this order ID this on the response. So at this point, you kind of know that your order has been placed, right? What has been placed? You, you got an order ID for it. Okay, now, at the same time, you have a different thread that's looking, trying to find out what the order book is. What are the orders available to trade, right? And you, you can do this right now. This is the best get the request. You can actually do this. Where is my mouse pointer again? There you go. Um, there you go. So it's just a bet request. You get the order book back, right? With the bids and asks. Uh, and if you go back there, imagine that you first place here uh, in order to buy uh, three bitcoins for thousand seventy-seven dollars seventy-seven cents. You got your ID back, and now you know at the same time or close to the same time. Apparently, you ask for the order book, and you get this order book back, right? And it says, well, there are orders who are willing to buy, um, you know, Bitcoins for $1,077.77. And there are 7.5 Bitcoins worth of those orders, right? Now, question, is your order included in that 7.5 or not, right? Has your order been already been executed and now it's no longer there and somebody else placed this? Or is your order still there? What's, you know, what's the status here? Right, and you just don't know, right? So the timestamp here is very coarse, and to be honest, you can't really trust these timestamps. Um, so it's actually on purpose. I did it; it would match the you know the time, daytime field on the response we got. But even if it didn't, these these are not reliable. So on Bitstamp, you are out of luck. Is that because they they don't care to to kind of keep it reliable? So it's just sort of. Mildly informative. That API is just a bad API. Okay, <laughs> it's just a bad API. So they're trying to be efficient and with respect to uh, reporting the market, but aren't. Yeah, I, yeah. It does, just doesn't work, right? So if you want to train in Bitstep, this is the problem. Yeah. So there's no way to just query like what's the price and then make a decision. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's. I mean, there's a, there's a different attempt to try to fix this problem. So Gdax. Try to make Gdax. Right. What you do is like when you make a, the same thing, let's try to do that at GDAX, right? And what happens there is like you actually make the same post request, different price. You want to spare some? They give you a big order ID, okay? And then you go look at the books, right? And we can do the same thing here, right? I can look at the books. Let me see if I can look at that books. So the price of Bitcoin is right now. Whoa. So Bitcoin is going for 1,182, something one, something like that, okay? Anyway, so that's. That's and look at if you look at the order book, each order has an order ID, right? So that's easy for us, right? If you look at you know, your response, you have the order ID of your order. Once you get the order book, you know, you see the order ID, good to go, right? You know that the order is included or not. In almost all situations, right? Not everywhere. Right, so, um, so the problem here is that what if you make the request to actually place the order and the network hangs, right? 
and you don't actually get back the order ID yet. You're going to, but maybe there's like a you know drop packet or something, and then you get the order book. Well, you have all these order IDs, but you don't actually know your order ID yet. So in those circumstances, still, you don't know if your order is included in the order book or not. Okay, so it's not quite there. Um, if you look at this order book, it has some extra information for each order, right? So I'm going to just show you my order book type, okay, on Haskell. Um, and, you know, it's pretty simple. I call it a quote book because from my point of view, that's what it is. It gives me quotes, right? Much of that say. Um, and, you know, quotes are super simple, buy or sell, price and volume, right? And there's this cute tail like this, you know, exchange specific type, right? Which in the order book for Gdask is going to be the order ID, right? On Bitstamp, I just don't have anything. I just put a unit in there. Right. Uh, and the, the book book, that's all it is, right? It's the, you know, the bids of the asks and the timestamp. Uh, for the first example, Bitstamp, the timestamp is just literally a timestamp. The calendar is a timestamp. For the DAX, they actually give you me a sequence number, which is actually much more useful. Right? It's very strict. Okay. So this is the order book type that the code uses. Okay. Now, there's one more way to try to fix this problem with the, the synchronization that you can do with the DAX. And that's the way the code actually uses is Gdax provides you with a WebSocket feed of everything that happens in the market. So every time an order is placed, every time an order is canceled, which I didn't mention before, we can just cancel an order. Every time something matches, everything is on the Gdax WebSocket feed, right? And when you place an order also, you allow to provide them with your identifier for that order, okay? So here's how it works, right? Um, you start monitoring that WebSocket feed, you get initial order book, and then you monitor the WebSocket, you get every single update. So you keep your WebSocket in sync with what's happening in the exchange, right? You go along and you actually place your order, right? But when you place the order, you actually include an opaque client order ID, right, in your request. And now the network hangs, right? The, on your post request, the network hangs, and you're waiting to find out what your real order ID is going to be. But that's not a problem. Right? Because as you look at the market web, web feed, web socket feed, if your order you know, comes in, you're going to see your identifier there. Right? And then you know your order is in place. If you don't see it, then you have to time out. Right? You have to time out. But I don't think you can solve this problem. You can use one of the problem. <laughs> right? Computer science. So you choose your own client ID, or there's a you choose your own. Right. Is there some algorithm for creating them so that you don't conflict with? So it's it's a little library actually. You can just choose a random number and add a secret tag to it. And provided by Gdax, that they provide no, but you. Okay, but I mean, um, so if I'm placing an order, I get to just choose any number, right. and they don't modify it. So, so, so there's a different, so let me clarify that. When you place an order, you provide a client order ID. When they receive the order from you on the WebSocket feed, they say, hey, I received an order, here's my order ID, and here's the corresponding client order ID for the order I received. Okay. Right, so you'll be able to match the two, and then from that point on, you use theirs. Does that make sense? Yeah. What about collision? Collisions on? On the plan for the ID. It's a 128 bit number. So it's not two to the 64 before you have two, and it has to collide, you know, in that time frame that makes sense. Right? So, okay. so it can collide, but I mean, if you've chosen your number pseudo randomly or something. Right. It, so, like so the library I use for this is available. You, I pick a 64 bit random number. And I basically do like a H map on it, and I identify that as my order, right? The collision probability on that is going to be two to the sixty-three, right? So I'm not going to I'm going to get many many requests before I have to worry about. That. So, sorry, on this WebSocket feed, can anyone see all like here like everyone's client IDs? Yes. So couldn't you impersonate? 
I don't, I don't know if that's useful at all. That's why, so that's why you have to first choose a random number and then kind of sign it and your signature is also going to look random. So it just looks random from anybody else, point of view, except yours. So there's a, there's a library I use to do this, the, it's called Stegul UUID, and it just does just that. It's like stegulographically, you just put a random number that you know it's your random number, but nobody else does. Everybody good? Any more questions? All right, keep going. So, you know, three attempts to get the synchronization right. Um, I wanted to, and this is just one question, right, that we have can ask the exchange, right? Is my order in the latest order group? Uh, we can ask other things. Has my order already executed, right? And here's another one, like how much money or bitcoins do I have? Right? And this, this is very simple, but um, just, just think about this, right? So if you want to buy three bitcoins and you place an order to buy, the exchange needs to know you have the money to actually buy those three bitcoins, right? So it's going to place that amount of money on hold, right? And it's no longer going to become available. So if you, for example, if you play an place an order to buy three bitcoins for $1,000 and you had initially $10,000, now all of a sudden you have seven thousand dollars available for trading and three thousand on hold, right? If you then go on and cancel that, then the amount on hold goes back to being available. So you have these two values, right? If you execute, the amount on hold disappears, but it doesn't doesn't go back to being available, right? Um, same thing for if you're going to sell, right? But if you're selling, you're going to place your bitcoins on hold, right? points of right? And if you can see it here, like it's very, if you wanted to keep track of this, it's pretty simple right? in some sense, right? Just like a finite, little finite stick machine. Every time you place an order, you just add the amount on hold. You know, there's a little, little tiny finite stick machine that's kind of neat there, right? Um, and guess what? It's stateful, right? So, I mean, I'm going to all this late to really convince you guys that there is some state that happens at the exchange that you need to keep track of on your trading agent, right? You have to keep, you have to know whether you have placed the order. You need to know whether your orders have been canceled. You need to know even if the price is increasing or decreasing. So you kind of have to remember what's happened, right? How much money do I have right now? Have I not have enough money to place a big order or don't I have enough money? So you kind of have to keep track of you know, that, that state. Right, um, and that just enables you to synchronize your you know workings with exchange right away. Okay, so that's that's the point of this part. It's like it seems that this thing is stateful, and we can try to deal with that in different ways. Okay, now I'm going to try to show you a really good way to deal with that. Okay, um, so this part is about functional reactive programming and reactive banana. Right, um, who's here is familiar with the reactive banana? Has used it in the past? Anybody? What's his mini one called? The Tasty or? Uh, oh, um, no, no. So there is, he has a, a, a. It's kind of an HTML web browser thing. Right. He's a, he's a, he's a, it's not reactive, but he has, I'm not calling it a plugin, it's not a plugin to deal with GUIs. It's a three penny GUI. Yeah. Which is a, a way to, but that's specific to GUIs. But it's kind of based on the same ideas. Right. He, yeah, exactly. Um, so reactive banana, it's just a functional active programming. Um, library, right? So here's my take on functional reactive programming and how I think about it. Okay, and this is going to be obviously reflected in the code, but for me, every time I think FRP, I just think time varying, right? And things can vary in time in two different ways. Uh, they can vary in time again continuously, so at every, every little instance in time, um, you have a value, right? So that's what we call a behavior, right? So we have things like, you know, a mouse click that really only has value at certain specific instances of time, right? So only when you click the mouse, you know which point you clicked, right? When you're not clicking the mouse, there's no point, right? It doesn't make any sense. So it's a discrete variation in time. Uh, does this make sense? No? 
Okay, so this is the distinction between two. In reactive banana, I mean, so these are called behaviors and events. And to be honest with you, think of event as an event stream, not a single event, but a stream of events. Okay, the types say event, but think of it as an event stream. In reactive banana, there's a little um, hierarchy of types, right? So first of all, um, it's reactive banana is an amazing library. I mean, by the end of this, you see why it's it's really really cool. Um, but they have a hierarchy of types. So, you know, if you want a type that does vary with time, you have to wrap it in either an event or a behavior. Okay? And that at that point is memoryless. Right? So it does not recall the past. If you want to make something record, remember the past, you have to wrap it in this moment monad. Okay, either moment or moment IO. So, so, okay? so then you can remember the past. Okay, so this is pretty easy. Just the library provides you with some combinators, right? So, for example, the, the filter E, filter events, pretty simple, right? You give it an event stream, have a little predicate, you're only going to see on the output events that pass the predicate, right? If it's true, you see it. If it's not true, you don't see it, right? Again, think of event as an event stream, not as a single event, okay? And then you have apply, which basically applies a behavior. And again, a behavior is defined at every instant of time to an event stream. So no, event comes in, you multiply by two, you know, or maybe later you will want to multiply by four. The behavior varies in time, okay? But it's always all defined. And you get the events out, right? Simple combinators, right? The kind of combinators I like. <laughs> uh, anybody good with this? Does, do, do these make sense to you? Like? Just by the type signatures? Cool. So now, the stepper combinator. Stepper combinator uh, basically introduces memory, right? And you can see that on the output type, right? A, the signature has a modal moment on the output type. And it's just a stepper function. It just remembers the last value until you change it, right? So here in this example, right? Um, on the right hand side, you see stepper two of some specific event. So it's going to start with the value two until that event occurs. And you can see that event here occurs on the left side with a value of one. So at that instance, actually just after that instance, it's going to change its value to one. Right? This is a, you know, a little bit different from what you do in math. In math, the stepper function at zero, it is one, so it quickly changes. This change is a little bit delayed so that you can use recursion within your, within your functions, okay? But this is the step of function. If you keep following this along, right? Once it's at one, it's gonna keep that value until another event happens, in which case it's gonna be value three, and then just after that happens, it's gonna change its value to three, right? You guys see that? Does that make sense? All right, so this is the step. Right? And he has to be in a mode at moment because he has history. Right? And basically, this is the only thing we have that can give us a behavior from an event. Right? This is pretty much it. Okay? Um, one thing that I didn't say, we have no units of time here. We do not specify what the units of time are. It's, it's co continuous time. Right? We don't know what the units are going to be. Um, so, some combinators. Now, there are a lot more, right? These actually do make sense. Um, you know, um, for example, never, uh, it was just very simple, never, event that never occurs, right? The union with, again, it just gets two event streams and fuses them. And the firm function you, say, you see there from A to A to A, um, it just tells you what to do when the events occur at the same time. Right? If two events occur at the same time, use this function to fuse it. Right? But basically just unions two event streams. Okay? And then there are a few more uh, combinators at the bottom here that are uh, a little bit more sophisticated. Right? Uh, but that's just it. And you basically use applicative laws and like the standard tools you use using Haskell for doing the program. Right? Great library. Great library. Now, little Side, side thought here. 
Uh, remember the slide, the things we can do um, to trade? That's it. You know, you can you know, place new orders. Okay. So what is the trading strategy in this framework? Think about it this way. It's a function, right? That gets a few event streams. Order placement, new order book coming in. Every time one of these things happens, order cancellation, or if order was matched, filled, right? Every time one of these things happens, an event occurs, right? And then what does it do? It outputs a list of actions that you have to take. Right? So if you look at back, these are the actions. You can place an order, you can cancel an order, right? You can like, so it's a list of actions because there might, might be more than one action you might want to place at that instance. So say you have a, you have the cheapest order, no, you, you, you have the cheapest sell order and somebody just puts the price slightly before you, no, lower than yours. You want to cancel your previous order and undercut the guy, you know? So you want to do two actions, you know, at the same instance, right? So that's what your trading strategy is, right? So it's in the moment monad because it has to have memory, right? It needs to have memory. It needs to remember what's happened, right? But that's what it is. Trading strategy is just that, right? That's all it is, for me anyway, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm sure you can do much better. <laughs> um, so, all right, let's look at some really simple trading strategies. I mean, pathetically simple which is kind of good as a starting point, right? Let's see if we can follow along. Can you guys see this code? Is it too small? Is it okay? Can you see it? Okay. So this is a trading strategy that has no memory, right? You can see it on the type signature, it has no memory. What does it do? Every time it sees an event that you placed an order, right? It's either, a limit order or a market order, right? You cannot cancel market orders, again, because they execute immediately. Try to do that, you might get an error. So we're not interested in those. We filter those out, okay? So you have an event stream of these play order placements, you filter it out, and basically then you just, you know, F map into the remaining place limit orders. No, this simple operation, right? Get the order ID, create a order cancellation for that order ID, right? And then to list just causing all the empty list, just, just like to make the you know, list of actions make sense. Okay, that's it. This, this little strategy is every time it sees, it's not placing any orders, right? That's a problem with that. But if it sees an order you placed, it's immediately going to try to cancel it if it's a limit order, right? You look at the, the filter E uh, combinator there, it's memoryless, right? It doesn't have any memory. So it's just an event A on the output. Dimitri, which are the, uh, what is the stream of events we're looking at here? The, your own? No, no your own. No, okay, no, it's not no. the collected no. one from. Sure, yeah, good, good point. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is. Think of it as like your own. So you're you're looking at your right. inspecting your own uh, behavior, or right? Set events. Sorry. Exactly. So think of it as this way. Every uh, the way that this is being maybe I should explain that more. The way that I look at the events that happen. Let's slide back here. Oh yeah. So see the order book can change, right? But then I can place an order myself. I can cancel my own orders, or I can have one of my orders be matched. By the market and then there's some execution. So the top one is like just what's happening in the market, and the bottom three is what happens to my orders. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. So you, you're watching the GDAX feed, you know, the WebSocket feed, and you already filtered out everything that's not your own orders. You only look at your own orders for the bottom three events. Make sense? Okay. I mean you, you might look at it for right. other purposes, but that's not what you're talking about in this. Right, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? Okay. Um, the way uh, it's looking right now is just I'm getting the whole order book and saying, this is the order book, that's not me, right? In fact, this order book is gonna remove my own orders, hmm. right? So separate this two out. Okay. Um, people okay with this little function? 
Yeah, there's, there's a, you know, the, the, sorry, the tool is here is just, just a silly thing. Okay, so this, this has no memory, right? So let's do something that has a little bit of memory. Okay, so first let's do the helper function. So this function here is going to look at an event stream and it's just going to generate another event stream that only has the first event that occurred, right? Just gets the first event, all right? And, you know, what does it do? How does it do that, okay? And, you know, we have to use the combinators that Reactive provides us with, right? And if you look at the type signatures here, right, for, for example, if you, if you look at stepper, right, we start with a value of true on the event stream that's output by stepper, right? So stepper starts with true, and then as soon as an event happens, an event stream is like listened to, and an event happens there, it changes to false, right? Immediately after, immediately after the event happens, it changes to false, right? And so what we're doing here, we're just applying a, a filtering function, the when e, the first combinator that on, those, on the comments there, that's going to filter the event stream that we're getting, right? Using this, this behavior, right? So the behavior is initially true. It's initially true, right? And as soon as the event happens, immediately afterwards, it's going to change to fault, to false. So we're going to output the first event that we're going to see. That event is also going to change the value of this behavior. And that's going to block us from, you know, seeing anything else. Okay, so this this combinator just picks the very first event. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So then we can use this combinator, right? If you look at the what we had before, now we have a slightly more complicated strategy that now has a memory, as you can see by its type. There's a moment I/O is in the moment I/O monad. It has to have that if you need to have memory. And basically, what it does is just it first filters, you know, the event stream it's looking at for the placement using that combinator, right? So instead of seeing every single order placement that is a limit order, it's just going to look at the first limit order, and then it's going to do the same thing we did before, creating a cancellation for it, right? And that's all it does. Makes sense, right? Simple, right? Any, any questions here? So, I mean, you can see that it might be really useful here to have a combinator library for this, right? Uh, I don't have one yet. I wish I did, <laughs> right? But it's like a combinator library for trading, right? For trading strategies. And it's basically based on the combinators out of Reactive Luna, right? All right, everybody with me? Yeah? Any, any, any questions? Are you guys already quiet? <laughs> do, 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 I, do I go back on that slide? Go ahead. Are you having problems with memory leaks using the, the, the uh, monad moment thing that builds up um, memory? Like, have you had any problems with memory leaks? I've had um, memory leaks on my code. Yeah. Uh, not on Reactive Banana. Yeah. Is that something you watch? So, so Reactive Banana is very careful to make sure that the operations you can do with this moment monad so first, the two, two requirements, right? You cannot look into the future, right? You cannot depend on something that hasn't happened yet. And then once you do, you have to, ahead of time, tell it what it wants to remember. Otherwise, you have this huge memory leak. Right? You have to keep, because you don't know what you're going to look at in the past, you have to remember all the past, right? So he's very, they're very careful to avoid that problem. Right, so I have uh, it's something they're aware of. I've never I never seen that. I there was you know some problems in my code for you know which is not related to this, right? But I haven't seen this. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? You good? We're gonna keep plowing them. Okay. Now, so great. We have a we have a strategy, right? Like like this. That's that strategy formatted to fit this window, <laughs> right? How do we run it, right? How do we, 
you know, give it events, how do we place the orders, how do we do that? How do we take, make the plumbing to that strategy? Okay? Um, and if you guys have used reactive banana before, it might be really simple, but just to give you an idea, right? The way it works with reactive banana is that, let's see how we run this thing. This thing in the moment, IO monad, is, gets compiled into something called an event network, right? So there's a compile function you call on this moment IO monad thing and it compiles it into an event network. And then you activate this network. Once you activate it, it's listening for events, right? So in this case, if you actually run this code, which does exactly that, it compiles it, it activates it, and then just waits. Nothing is going to happen, right? Because we're not actually placing any input there. So if you actually want to listen for some input, how do you fire that event inside the moment I don't want to have, right? A few extra steps you have to go through here, right? And you know, this is the way the reactive learning works. The first thing you do is that you have to group your events, um, group your set of callback that are gonna fire your event, right? And that's the new handler set here. Um, in fact, in the library, this is called new ad handler. I find that name ad, new ad handler really confusing. So think of it as a set of handlers. In the sense that a handler is a callback that basically just takes a value and fires that value for you, right? Inside your moment, I don't know. Right, so here, this trigger placement event function is a, is a callback, right? You call it, you're gonna fire an event, right? Here, I just gave it a, a variable, some placement, right? Some order placement that I place on the exchange, right? So looking at the bottom, right? The bottom red line. Um, and in the beginning, before I actually um, you know, compile my event network, I create a set, uh, an event set, and I tell, in, you know, tell my event network to listen to that, right? So this from handler set just says, every time somebody calls a callback, fire an event inside the moment I open it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, every, so when, once I activate this network, when I call this trigger placement event function, an event is going to fire inside here on, this, on the side of this, this um, black box there, on the, no, the, the place event is going to fire. Yes. Uh, can you activate multiple networks and will it fire the event on each one? Okay, so we're going to get there. So this is for um, inputs, right? Now, uh, what about the outputs, right? How do you do that, right? So um, there's a function that Reactive Learning provides you called Reactimate. And what, if you look at this type signature, it needs uh, event of type IO unit, right? So basically, you provide it with uh, an event stream, and every time that event stream fires, it's going to execute the corresponding I.O. action, right? So that's what we're doing. So that's how you get output, right? Uh, so here in this situation, you know, we had a set of actions that we're going to output, and we're just going to print them to string. So the actions is an event stream of actions, right? The print is just F mapped into that event stream. Right, and then you use reactivate on it, and every time you fire an action, it's going to print that action. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the just real thing is just the I/O unit, you know, the I/O action inside the event stream, but you just get that with a F map. Right. Um, so pretty quick, pretty simple. Well, what if you wanted two outputs, right? Right. You just put two of them. So they're they're. If you look at this here, right, you are calling the IO monad from within the moment IO monad, right? So you can look at this actually as a, you know, big block. And here you have like two outputs in some sense. You're calling the IO monad at two different places in your moment IO monad, okay? And then you also, um, you know, pulling data from the IO monad using this from handler set 
function, right? That's going to get fired every time a callback is called. Right? So this is the event network. Okay. In fact, it's actually a compiled version of the event network, right? It has like this case has one input, two outputs, right? What are the characteristics of these event networks, right? So it's a gigantic, ginormous synchronous callback, right? Time stops when you're this moment I own more, right? It's literally, time stops. Everything uh, is, is not like a regular monad when I think it's supposed to exit in sequence. It's more like a let block where everything works simultaneously. At least conceptually, that's the model, right? Um, multiple entry points, multiple exit points, right? Um, which is kind of interesting, right? And it's totally thread safe, which is fantastic, right? So it's really cool. Like this thread safe, so I was like, wow, right? I can have multiple threads calling to this thing with multiple entry points and multiple exit points. And the thing just works and updates everything, keeping my state, you know, I'm doing very well. Okay, so this is the idea. How does the agent that I work here right now? Um, well, I have a little thread that monitors that WebSocket, right? So everything that happens on the DAX, every order placement, every new book, I get, you know, an event firing thread inside my event network. And my event network is basically my trading strategy. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so say say this happens. Say there's a new order book that comes in, right? It's gonna fire an event inside that trading strategy. This trading strategy is gonna generate some other event action, and that's gonna call an IO action, right? So it's gonna like generate some output, right? But imagine that on the output side here, I wanna place an order or cancel an order. I have to make a network call that might take three seconds, right? And I don't have to be waiting for that to return, <laughs> right? So we're not doing that, right? So not so great, but we're gonna place a, a queue there, a FIFO queue. Right? Just say, do this action. We lose guarantee of execute, time, ex time execution, but we don't really have that anyway, right? So we're gonna put that, that little FIFO there, right? And now what we have is we have another thread, which is the execution thread, that just reads this FIFO nonstop, right? And it just does whatever it has to do. Okay? Place an order, cancel an order, right? Now there is one interesting situation. If you remember like one of the first examples, when you place an order using the REST API, if that comes back with an order ID, you know the order has been placed, right? So at that point, you can kind of fire an event, say, hey, order placed, order placement, okay? In Gidax, we don't need to do that because they have this great WebSocket. We can just look at the WebSocket and you get all the events in the WebSocket. But for Bitstamp, you don't have the WebSocket. It doesn't work the same. So in fact, when you place the order and you get like the network call finishes and it's done, it gives you an order ID, you actually want to call back into your event network and say, Fire another event, or the place, or the placement, right? Now we have a small problem here, right? What happens if the queue is pretty full, right? If this FIFO queue is pretty full, say it has 10, 10 values, right? And it's full, and you just did something, and now you want to call into it again. Well, you're gonna be want to place another value on the queue, but the queue is full, so you're gonna block. But you're the consumer, so you're the only thread that can actually move items from the queue, but you're blocked. So the queue is never gonna, you know, be empty, empty. So you block forever, right? So this queue has to be unbounded. Right? You cannot, unless, if you, if you Bound it and you get close to that, maybe that's what you want. You want to block because you like, you know, figure out that you're not processing your actions fast enough, right? But if you want to have a guarantee that it never blocks, you have to, does that make sense? All right, so, so that's, that's the idea, but that's it, right? So a um, few points about the execution, right? 
again, it's best effort, right? When I place an order uh, on the SKU, immediately the executors will try to pick it up and execute it. But again, I mean, maybe the network's down, I don't know. Best effort, right? Multiple threads, one on the input, on the output, right? And you have this, this queue on the output side, right? So for one exchange, that's what it is, right? Now imagine you want to trade on seven exchanges or three exchanges. Simple, right? You add two threads, you add an output queue, done, right? And you can generate from events in one exchange, you can generate actions to replace another exchange. The events, just like, you know, the thing about it, right? So it's really easy. And one more, that's it, right? Just, just keep doing it. Okay. So it seems like you're um, assuming that you have an infinitely fast computer to do your event <clears throat> Because if you aren't fast enough, they also not consume. They don't, I'm getting, what I'm getting hung up on is how, right. how you don't all of a sudden, like very often have like cycles fall all the time on the input too, right? So say that again. Oh. On the input, you must have cycles as well because you get this data and you just get the workloads of events or? So you never, yeah. So, you, so I am assuming that the trading agent is fast enough to be able to consume the data faster than it's produced. So that's definitely an assumption. And, and the same thing on the, on the execution side, right? Because otherwise if there's an unbalanced queue and there's placing actions to be, and it's not, they're not being consumed, then sure enough, right? And actually that's the further work, right? So this delay between what I'm getting my information from and how long it's taking um, for that to execute, those delays are not taken care of here. I'm just assuming that I can process that you know, fire hose of information faster than it's been produced, and I can also issue orders to another execution thread, and that thread is going to be fast enough to always catch up with me. Well, it seems like to, to, that's true, right? Because it's working. For, yeah, for Bitcoin, it's true, right? If I was doing this on NASDAQ, obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> right? For Bitcoin, so far, it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a medium distance on Amazon, so it's not even. <laughs> so, so conclusions here, right? So just this is this is it. But um, so seems like one of the things that I was surprised by when I started this is that the stateful nature of trading and how you need it's very important for you to synchronize yourself, your view of the world with the exchanges view of the world, and that was made a lot easier by using the FRP, right? A lot easier. So I was very surprised by that. Um, and, and I was also surprised by how good Reactive Banana was in dealing with these multi threading situations. This is really good. Had you tried something before FRP? And how did you get the, and if you had, how did you get the idea to use FRP? Uh, so I, I'm still using pipes for some of this. And, and then like, um, so the idea for using this is by, was basically by noticing that you had to keep state and, um, that the state would not change until something happened, right? And then I looked at the stepper combinator at Reactive Banana and things started to match up, right? So that was like, you know, how I came about this, 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 this design, okay? I mean, so this is clearly not the fastest, Design of it, this is it. Um, but it's, I think, uh, easy to see it's correct most of the time. Okay? There are two things that I think when you mentioned, like they're left out, right? So one is like looking at these delays in execution, right? Once you issue an order to execute, well, how long is it taking for that order to execute? Because if it's taking too long, your strategy might change it in its mind. Okay, actually, because it's going to take me you know, three seconds for this to execute. Instead of placing this order, I'm going to place another one. So the strategy may change its behavior depending on how long it takes for its request to be fulfilled. So how do you model that then? Because you're saying um, you want to have a strategy change based on an elapsed time. You were talking about how there's, I mean, that's not an input to your model. Time so is. you can, I mean, so two things. You can have another event, which is just a time of tick. A tick. Okay. Tick. Tick. Right. Or you can just write the. So how time expensive in. would it be then to apply ticks at some frequency to your 
model. I don't think it's right. It's not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what you could do also is just um, uh, maybe have a timestamp on the event itself, right? A real time. Stamp. Yeah, real time. Stamp. There's a problem with that. The one thing is that it was about back testing, right? So whenever you deploy a new testing strategy, uh, trading strategy, you want to back test it on previous data, right? Mm -hmm. So you change its input. And you want to do the back test way faster than you actually trade, if you can. And in this situation, you can. So you don't want to have like a, like a real timestamp. You kind of want to have a simulated timestamp in those situations. Um, but then, you know, but that's, you know, makes it hard in one way, but maybe it's a good way to do it. It seems like you were saying there's a lot of uncertainty, or it could be a lot of uncertainty on how many Bitcoins are in the exchange and how much cash you have in the exchange. Is there some form of way of fixing that? So, so, that so, for you so this fixes stop. it. So, so I guess I wasn't clear on that. So, um, so the way, for example, for BDAX, I only look at the WebSocket stream. In my state is synchronized with the state of the WebSocket stream. So, if I uh, place an order, I it already comes in with my order ID. So as long as it shows up on the WebSock stream as a received order, which is the earliest time I will find out it's being received, I fire the order placement event, and I know the order is there, and I immediately, uh, in this moment I owe one adage, everything happens at the same time conceptually, decrease my available funds. So I'm, in some sense, I just so perfectly Let me ask the question a different way. So the, when you set out a, you know, some sort of order of some kind, whatever it is, uh, it could take a long time for that particular thing to happen. And you might not be getting, you might be asking the question, what's the order, what's the order, what's the order, what's the order? you don't see it. And so all of a sudden you place this form of some order, order, buy, sell, whatever. And you, and you go, okay, I'm going to do another one. I'm still waiting on this one. I'll do another one. Okay. And then all of a sudden I'm waiting on that one. Wait, this could just build up. For you know maybe right. several seconds, and you're trying to set, sell and right. So that's a good point. So so the uh, the trader agent doesn't have a notion of time, right? Mm -hmm. So but so here's what happens, right? So say I place an order. I don't even monitor the result of the network call. I ignore it. The other thread that's listening on the DAX of socket, it's going to receive a call a receive message, receive message from from DAX. It's going to see the opaque identifier to say, okay, my order has been placed. That can be many seconds later. Yes. Right? Okay, that. But so that's one thing. Before that, when I place the order on that FIFO queue in the output, the state for my strategy already knows the, the request to place an order has been made. Right? So that's immediate. Is there, but when a case that fails, Right, so you, you'd have to time out. Yeah, so right. all of a sudden you start trading. And so to, I'm looking at all the right. bad edge cases. So you have right. this bad edge case where you're just like building up orders, 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 and all of a sudden they all fail. Or, you know, you, and they might be sell orders when you, you assume you're gonna all of a sudden have this cash available there, right? And you don't have it, you put in some buy. So you see, you would know that the order, the action, to place an order has been asked for, and you would not see the order placement. So you would see those accumulate without the court is going in. So you know it's been asked for, you also know it hasn't been seen. Yeah, okay. Right, so you can just use a buffer and time out after two or three, I don't know, right? But, but yeah, I mean, but there's no notion of time in waiting to do so, right? So that is true. Yeah. So, so these are, Works. This is it, guys. This is basically it. Um, uh, the code is all available on, on GitHub. Uh, good, strategies. Questions. good questions. Good questions. How are you, are you, go ahead. Uh, where is this being used? Where I, I, I I've, been, I've been making money on this for the last few years. That's my full time thing. You're just like. On your own. Well, so, so here's the thing. I, I guess have been the high frequency trader on the Bitcoin world in some sense. And like the market is getting more efficient and my income is going down. My income is going down. So like at this point, I'm not sure it's worth doing it. So I'm just open sourcing it. 
and now we'll all run it and make it even worse for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, maybe we can make it better. And I, you know, I think hire five people too. Well, so so here's a difference though. Like so, um, the very simple strategies of buying a place and selling it another, they're gonna go away, right? But I think uh, in finance, there's a sophistication on the trading strategy itself, right? You can somehow predict the future, even briefly. You can make a lot of money, right? So I think they, I'm trying to substitute my sophistication for financial sophistication rather than computer science sophistication. Right? So. It seems like I, I was kind of wondering about that because it sounds like all your trading strategy is based on just the current state of the order book, and and you, so you are you thinking about bringing in like more technical analysis? Or? So, so think about it, that trading type for the trading strategy <coughs> has memory. So you can look at past order books and calculate trends based on past order books. It just needs to you know, make those calculations happen. Yeah. So I, I have other trading strategies that are more sophisticated that do that, right? Um, it's not what you expect. Most of the time, you lose money. Huh? <laughs> I mean, you lose money really quickly, right? <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> right? But yeah, you, you can build a much more sophisticated strategies, right? So this is like a execution engine, and your strategy on top of this, which is like we need those um, combinators for that, you can make much more sophisticated. How does like chaining works, like a common thing you'll see like the trading systems is like the big guy that like emits like signals and there's like someone later who's like creating like position sizing. I guess it's less an issue with currencies but like for trading other asset classes. And then there might be another guy who's like like calculating the total acceptable exposure for right. any given instrument or group of instruments. Right, like, so you put that one network, do you use that separate network? Same, same with the network because I want the calculations to all happen at the same time. So you'd have like a some function, right, that outputs a moment, event. Right, so, so um, instead of outputting an event action, I can uh, say a moment, event, double, right, which is a price or currency. Or current best price, right? And then I just execute, you know, pull that out on the moment I open that and have that back. Guy. Yeah. Has or you can generate a behavior. So in this case here, of the how much money do I have, the amount of hold is a behavior. It's always well defined. And in instant time, I know how much money I have a hold, how much money I have available. And I can just use that values, those values inside this moment I own. But they all will, if it's a behavior, it's always well defined. Right. As, can you enforce separation then between the concerns? Then, so, so it's like the the upstream guy can't see the downstream. Does that make sense? Think of it as like a, a function call, right? So if, say you want say say you want to know whether the price is going up quickly, right? Um, so you can write a function that takes an event stream that's the order book, uh -huh. and it, it has to remember it, uh -huh. right? So it has to be in the moment I want it, right? And based on previous order books, so it just keeps them all, and it calculates a trend. There's like some linear regression or something, calculates uh -huh. a trend, right? That can then return to you uh, a, you know, moment price trend value, right? Uh -huh. In an event stream. So every time you have a new order book, you recalculate that, 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 and you get that, right? And you can then use maybe a stepper or something to get that as a behavior. So yeah, anytime you know what the price trend is based on the current information on the market. And then you can use that behavior as input to other functions. So just a parameter, so it's input to other functions. Yeah. Does that make sense? I think so. Are you doing any persistence of the memory? Like, no, no. no. It's yeah. all the memory, like you can So run. is this, um, well, not here. So I, I had like a previous version of this that would process stuff to the database. To be honest, it's so messy, I'm getting rid of it. And uh, I don't know how to do persistence. So there is a way to log everything that happens. I mean, so if outside this moment I went out, and you can just log that. Right? 
Was the performance the main issue with the persistence in database? No, just my code is ugly. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, let's say you want to decide a new strategy or something, like how would you test that? What was your approach that you can't fire? Yeah, so, so to be honest with you, like I was making most of my money on strategies that didn't really need testing in the sense that if they executed, I was making money. So like the, the example is the arbitrage, right? Mm -hmm. Ship here, it's expensive here, bites up quickly, right? That doesn't need a lot. Just make sure that you get the right size. <laughs> but, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't need like, I'm not, I'm not trying to predict the future. I'm not just, I say, I'm expecting the price to rise, so I'm gonna buy now and then later. So I don't, there wasn't a lot of back testing needed for that. And that's why it's a missing feature, right? But um, as you see, I'm using the pipes library to get this data feed. And the pipeline library can use producers and producer data, right? If I have the data, I can make a producer that just spews that out to me and do the back Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. This is all available on GitHub, guys. So go ahead, go crazy. And please, if you have, you know, pull the press, stop them. <laughs> <laughs>